Well, okay, I think um, uh, Arno uh, set the stage uh, for, the, uh, for the next talk. Of course, the, uh, the next talk should be, uh, not be given by me, but should be given by the uh, fellow who uh, you've heard mentioned now uh, on a few occasions, uh, uh, Jack Beliveau. Um, I first met Jack at a party. Uh, Jack had uh, originally uh, uh, been introduced to uh, uh, Tom Brady. Uh, Jack was a grad student actually working here at the med school with a fellow uh, uh, NMR spectroscopist, a common theme, um, uh, Eric Fossil. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, in the uh, world of uh, serendipity, uh, it plays an important uh, role in our lives. And uh, Jack had some, uh, you know, unfortunate uh, accident in the lab. Uh, something to do with a battery flying into the uh, spectrometer or some such thing. Uh, Eric uh, was, uh, uh, I think, uh, short-tempered, and history might perhaps suggest a short-sighted investigator at the time, uh, uh, got mad at Jack and threw him out of the lab. Uh, but uh, Jack, uh, as uh, those of you who uh, got to know him, uh, you know, uh, despite his, uh, um, his uh, you know, uh, physical uh, gangly nature as a young man, uh, was also uh, brilliant and driven, uh, and Tom Brady saw that. And while uh, others might have uh, walked away from a student who had uh, gotten into trouble with his advisor, uh, Tom didn't do that. Tom saw another uh, big, friendly, uh, enthusiastic uh, Irishman, despite his uh, uh, French on the mother's side. I think he always uh, valued uh, his Irish connections. Uh, always remembered uh, telling us how uh, his mom uh, um, wheeled him uh, down in the basket to uh, kiss the Blarney Stone as a uh, little infant and took him up and uh, decided uh, just to make sure she put him down again a second time. And somehow it must have worked, uh, you know, he uh, led a blessed life. Um, so in any case, Tom told me that there's this uh, new graduate student. He uh, carefully left out of the story what had happened in his previous lab uh, and uh, said, uh, you should meet him. And sure enough, at that time, I had just moved into a new apartment uh, in Cambridge. I was having a housewarming, uh, and so I invited him along. Um, and uh, in walks this guy that I had never met, uh, but uh, he was uh, hard to uh, miss. Uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, tall, uh, energetic, uh, and of course, uh, that was a, a friendship that would uh, last uh, for uh, many, many years. Uh, he was one of the last to leave the party. He always uh, appreciated a good party, um, but he also uh, spent most of the party talking about science and what he wanted to accomplish. Uh, and what he wanted to accomplish, as uh, Arno uh, kind of uh, hinted at, uh, was to see how the brain works. Now, Jack had. Uh, you know, even broader visions than understanding the brain, I think he wanted to encapsulate the brain. He had this uh, vision that if we understood and could map how the brain works, we could ultimately capture our thoughts uh, and perhaps uh, even find a way to preserve them. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're not quite there yet in our science, but uh, we seem to be moving inexorably in that direction. Uh, and I think, uh, but Jack uh, understood that the first steps were to try to see if we could, uh, uh, you know, figure out what the brain was doing and watch it work. So he was uh, aware of the experiments that uh, Arno had done. Uh, Arno was uh, getting ready to go back to Germany. Uh, sad for us, uh, fortunate for him to uh, have a chance to carry on his career. Uh, and so we were looking for somebody to carry on those experiments. Uh, and Jack seemed uh, the natural uh, person to uh, pick them up. But where did we go? As uh, Arno showed, uh, his, uh, his uh, you know, final set of experiments uh, you know, were using this uh, uh, you know, kind of um, uh, remarkable at the time, but then, you know, uh, looking back on it, somewhat uh, crude, uh, one-dimensional, uh, high-speed experiments. Uh, we had good reason, based on uh, Arno's uh, chemistry experiments, again, working with Randy Lawfer, uh, to uh, understand that it seemed to be a magnetic susceptibility effect, not a dipolar effect. Um, but really, exactly how it related to uh, blood flow, whether we could really use it as a quantitative measure uh, related to cerebral perfusion, this was still unknown. We only had the basic phenomenology uh, uh, in hand. And so, of course, the first job that Jack had to do before he could start doing, uh, you know, human uh, neural encoding uh, was to actually see whether we had a phenomena that we could really use in the way that our pet community colleagues uh, and nuclear colleagues had taught us before it could be done. Uh, and so uh, that's really uh, the purpose of uh, my talk, is just to try to highlight um, the role that Jack played and others, as you'll see as I uh, carry on to tell the story, kind of taking us between uh, where Arno left off uh, and that uh, beautiful cover in science where I'm uh, 
we're fortunate to have another one of the principals uh, carry on the story. Now, um, I hadn't had a chance to uh, talk in detail with Arno before his talk, but I was so glad that he uh, mentioned to you uh, these guys, uh, Randy Lawfer on the left, uh, his uh, um, uh, um, GI uh, radiology colleague, uh, uh, Sanjay Yaseni, uh, uh, on the right here. Uh, it's uh, a, a little known part of the uh, neuroscience uh, lore that it was actually uh, uh, what we used to call liver breaths at the time, folks that were interested in liver imaging that actually invented uh, functional uh, MR. Uh, but indeed, it was their original contrast agent experiments, as, uh, as Arno highlighted, uh, that really were the first to um, make this serendipitous finding uh, of a drop in signal. Remember the observation, uh, you know, shown on the slide was a focus on T1, and we knew that we would expect to see large dipolar changes in T1, much more than in T2, uh, and it was this kind of mistake, if you will, in the experiment, uh, and the fact that they made this observation and then um, did what I hope all the young people know uh, is, uh, you know, the key to your scientific careers, which is pay attention when you screw up and you see something interesting. Uh, because it's the unexplainable findings that are the, uh, often the most interesting ones, not the ones that support your hypothesis, but the ones that go completely against it. Right? Everybody knew that T1 gave the big changes, um, and this was on T2, and everyone knew the signal was supposed to go up with contrast agents, and the signal went down. And figuring that out turned out to have important implications, and of course uh, led to uh, this great work uh, that Arno, so, uh, that Arno just talked about. So. Uh, you know, uh, this is uh, Jack Beliveau. You've seen this picture. Uh, but uh, those of you who knew Jack well might have uh, thought of him more in uh, this setting, uh, a slightly crazed look on his face, uh, just the excitement of doing a new experiment, uh, almost uh, overwhelming him. Uh, here with, <laughs> with uh, Greg Simpson, uh, just another uh, picture of, uh, of our friend Jack. Uh, uh, he knew how to uh, have a good party as well as uh, do science, but no doubt if you were on the boat with him, you'd be talking science uh, while you were enjoying yourself, because that's what brought him uh, the greatest pleasure. Well, so uh, what were those original experiments? Remember, at the time, we only had uh, rodent models. We were actually uh, using what at that time was a high-field NMR imager. Uh, it was a 1.5T uh, uh, scanner. Uh, but uh, rodent size, so that was uh, the biggest uh, thing that we could uh, put in to see these. So in this uh, original uh, work, you can see uh, it took them a little while to submit it. I think the work was probably done in uh, 86 and in 87. Um, Jack was uh, deliberate in the pace of his uh, paper writing, uh, as uh, many of you who know him well well know. Uh, but uh, he extended the work uh, that uh, Arno had done in showing uh, the fundamental principle of susceptibility contrast uh, to basically show that the signal change not only was related to the uh, magnetic moment of the contrast agent, but actually directly related to the concentration of the contrast agent within the vascular space which again is extremely important if you're going to use kinetic tracer uh, analysis principles, you have to be able to relate the signal change uh, to the concentration of the agent as it's uh, moving through the uh, target organ. Uh, and in these original experiments, he did that. Notice the other uh, shift in those original experiments that, uh, uh, that Arno uh, uh, did. We were looking at drop and signal. At this point, Jack had uh, figured out that uh, uh, what we really wanted to measure, there was a nonlinearity in that drop and signal, that what we really wanted to measure was the change in the relaxation rate, the 1 over T2, uh, or the delta R2. Uh, and so this became the kind of uh, uh, ubiquitous measure that we have now for susceptibility effects, the change in T2 or the change in T2 star, uh, simply uh, 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 measured with a, a very uh, simple uh, mathematical uh, transform, uh, but an important way to kind of linearize the process and then allow us to basically demonstrate this uh, straightforward, nicely linear relationship between the contrast of the agent as it passed through uh, and the signal. Uh, and as uh, Arno implicated, uh, the next important uh, element was to show that this had physiologic importance as well as biophysics. So we had the biophysical measurements in the magnetic moment, in the concentration, but what physiological importance uh, did it have? Uh, and again, uh, uh, largely uh, on the suggestions that uh, Arno had made while he was here, uh, we uh, went on to study uh, the uh, hypercapnic challenge, which was kind of the the most straightforward way that we had to control the blood flow in the brain in a well-controlled manner. Because it was well known from other studies using other tools that, again, there was uh, 
a well-described relationship and linear over a certain range of uh, uh, concentrations of CO2 between the uh, inhaled CO2 and, of course, what was ultimately most important was the arterial CO2 concentration and the change in blood flow. Uh, and what Jack showed in a, a series of uh, experiments, um, here actually uh, clipped out of his uh, thesis, um, was that it, uh, we were able to show that this uh, change in R2 star, this change in the uh, magnetic susceptibility effect that we were able to measure within the tissue actually scaled as we expected it to with the uh, degree of uh, inspired uh, CO2. And in fact, that we could uh, then go back and look at the relationships that had been published and show that in fact, uh, we saw uh, very much the same uh, CO2 reactivity and uh, those of you who uh, uh, do uh, uh, neuroradiology and neurovascular coupling know that this tool of using a CO2 challenge has now become an extremely important one uh, as we look uh, to measure so-called cerebral vascular reserve in our patients uh, that are at risk of stroke, patients with carotid uh, stenosis, patients where we need to understand whether the brain is able to react normally uh, when given a uh, a, a, a need for increased blood flow. We use this hypercapnia effect uh, uh, today, and so this has uh, now become a routine tool in our uh, clinical uh, armamentarium, uh, really uh, you know, first uh, performed in quantitative physiologic experiments with MR with back, with, uh, by Jack back in, uh, uh, back in the late 80s. Uh, but of course, uh, ultimately, uh, you know, uh, in addition to understanding how the brain worked, Jack was uh, interested in diseases of the brain, uh, we had, uh, again, uh, uh, you know, the exposure to our uh, neurology colleague, uh, uh, Arno Villringer. Uh, fortunately, at the Mass General, neurologists could do MR research. In fact, uh, we're amongst the pioneers, folks like Ferdy Bonanno and Phil Kissler, uh, uh, active stroke uh, neurologists, the MGH, were always thinking about stroke uh, in the early days of uh, uh, what was then the NMR Center. Uh, so we uh, set out to try to uh, do a stroke model and see whether we could use these same tools to be able to see changes in perfusion in the setting of stroke. So uh, what was the model we used? Uh, the challenge with rats, though they were uh, excellent models, uh, uh, they uh, you know, were very robust, as uh, relatively hard to kill a rat, uh, which is uh, useful if you're putting them in a magnet uh, for a long period of time. Uh, the problem with rats, uh, good news for the rat, uh, bad news for us, is that they have a very robust cerebral circulation. And so in order to stroke out a rat, you really have to go way out into the middle cerebral artery uh, and doing simple procedures like, for example, ligating one carotid artery, something surgically simple to do, uh, won't touch the circulation to the rat. They have a very uh, intact uh, circle of Willis. Uh, they perfuse just fine. Uh, but uh, the Mongolian gerbil is uh, slightly less fortunate in that regard. Um, cute little guys, but uh, they have a, uh, uh, an unfortunate characteristic that in about a half to uh, uh, maybe a third of them, uh, their circle of Willis is not intact. And so when you do this simple uh, procedure of cutting down uh, and including one carotid artery, you get a unilateral stroke. And so this was the uh, uh, first uh, uh, animal model of course, became the uh, name of uh, Jack's uh, rock and roll band, the gerbil stroke model. A few of you old timers may have heard them play once or twice at Christmas parties years ago. Uh, um, memorable times indeed. But uh, uh, it came from uh, what was a well-established physiological model. Uh, and again, as part of Jack's thesis, uh, he was interested to use this effect. At this time, Jack had uh, uh, kind of extended uh, the imaging technology. Uh, the work in uh, high-speed gradient echo imaging had uh, uh, kind of filtered back from us, uh, you know, from Germany, so we implemented some of these high-speed techniques. They weren't so high-speed, but we could now, instead of taking two-minute images, take them, you know, in, in periods of, uh, you know, several tenths of seconds, short enough that we could begin to hope to capture that early uh, kind of first pass. Um, and indeed, we're able to do so with these contrast agents. The top image is actually a T2-weighted image uh, following this occlusion. You can see it's at T2 bright uh, in the area of the infarct. Uh, the image uh, uh, on the bottom left is the image uh, before uh, injection of the contrast agent. This is a rapid uh, gradient echo image. But the image on the right, where you can see um, uh, um, 
uh, increased signal because of the lack of the susceptibility effect uh, was the uh, uh, gradient echo image acquired uh, during the injection of the contrast agent uh, actually showing this. And here I'll just show another example. This was actually uh, uh, shown uh, in an abstract at ISMRM back in 1988, uh, dynamic imaging of uh, acute stroke. Now, of course, uh, there are uh, a lot of uh, interesting lessons to learn from that. Uh, one important lesson that uh, we've learned uh, subsequent to that is that when you have good ideas like that, you should patent them. It'll certainly drive you nuts if somebody else patents them. Uh, this is, uh, you can see, filed uh, 1990, uh, a method for detecting uh, perfusion variations. Uh, and the highlight is basically just a complete uh, description of Jack's uh, original abstract somehow not disclosed to the patent examiners. Um, but um, amazingly enough, the patent uh, was issued. Uh, I don't think anybody really ever got very rich on this, but uh, um, if anybody made any money, it should have been Jack. Uh, so when you have these good ideas, uh, maybe before you go and uh, submit them to the ISMR, uh, make sure you talk to our innovation office. Sometimes they're worth uh, something uh, and you don't even realize it at the time. This is uh, one good example. Um, but of course, uh, um, as we know, and as I'll talk about in, in a little while, the technique certainly had uh, important legs and important implications for clinical practice even today. But with all these uh, uh, methods uh, in the rat, as important as they were and as important as they were for validating the basic concept, it, uh, there still was another important gap, especially if we were going to do uh, human experiments. First, because our imaging times were so long, we needed very large doses of the contrast agent uh, uh, given over long periods of time to see these effects. And while in an animal model, of course, that was feasible, in a human that wasn't feasible when we were uh, limited in the dose we were seeing. Of course, we could extend the time we give it, but then it would become so dilute we wouldn't see the effects. So we were li really limited by the imaging capabilities that we had at the time. Even the gradient echo techniques of the time, you know, uh, with imaging times of tens of seconds just weren't really quick enough to make this a feasible human experiment. But fortunately for us, uh, other work was occurring elsewhere in the world that would turn out to uh, help us in a uh, very interesting way. Um, uh, in particular, it was the work of uh, the fellow uh, on the left, uh, Sir Peter Mansfield, one of the uh, two winners of the Nobel Prize for the uh, invention of MRI um, uh, amongst the many uh, important, uh, indeed seminal contributions that Peter Mansfield made was in his development of the tool that those of you who do fMRI use every day and that's uh, echoplanar imaging. So here's uh, a, a quote from his uh, Nobel Prize winning talk where he describes work from one of his uh, uh, graduate students at the time, uh, shown on the right here as a, a somewhat more mature uh, man, uh, Ian Pikett, where he showed that an early version of Echo uh, Planner was implemented originally by Ian, so he was really the first uh, to get this going, and he succeeded in obtaining a crude image of a test tube and later a live finger, right? So, you know, this was like a big deal back in the early days of NMR, and this was, as you can see, uh, in the mid-70s, so uh, almost a decade before the kind of work that uh, first Arno and then Jack were doing. And if you keep reading uh, uh, his uh, address, it was uh, very interesting because he goes on and gives another important uh, piece of history uh, because as time went on, uh, the technology continued to advance, and he mentioned that another one of his uh, uh, students uh, uh, who worked with uh, Ian at the time, a fellow by the name of uh, Richard uh, Rezedzian, um, um, the two of them, uh, well, Ian, of course, had been working at the Mass uh, General uh, at the time, was uh, actually the, the person that, uh, uh, you know, uh, did those first proton chemical shift imaging experiments, uh, um, you know, um, uh, as my uh, mentor and uh, thesis supervisor, uh, uh, you know, back in the early 80s. Uh, Ian, uh, with an opportunity that uh, came when a group from Wall Street knocked on his door and said, bring me a good idea and I'll raise some money for you. It was one of those, uh, you know, uh, frothy times down on Wall Street. Uh, and so he uh, knocked on the door of a colleague of his who was still back in England, uh, Richard Rosenzian, and said, you know, let's come over and build an echoplanar imaging scanner for humans. Uh, and that's what they did. I liked uh, the quote here. Although several prototype machines were produced, it never really took off in a big way commercially you know, back then. And this was, of course, uh, you know, the, the late 80s. Uh, and indeed, uh, advanced NMR, if you uh, try to look at them on the stock exchange, uh, you won't find them, right? They're uh, no more. Uh, 
Uh, but uh, their technology lives on, and it lives on uh, uh, in a very important way uh, in this history, because in fact, the very first of these prototypes was installed in a two Tesla machine uh, uh, at, uh, in Charlestown. We had just moved to Charlestown, just setting up our new lab. Uh, and um, uh, Ian, of course, uh, having his uh, longstanding connection to uh, uh, the NMR Center, uh, couldn't have thought of a better place to put his first scanner than at the MGH, uh, and that's exactly uh, what he did. So we uh, at the MGH had access to the first human scale, high field echoplanar imaging device. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, you know, I'm always uh, very uh, proud of the fact, uh, you know, most people in NMR can trace their lineage back, you know, to either uh, Lauderbur or uh, Mansfield, a few perhaps uh, to Demadian. Uh, I'm very proud of the uh, connection uh, through there, uh, you know, from uh, uh, myself uh, to Ian, my thesis advisor, uh, to Sir Peter, so he's kind of my, my grand thesis uh, advisor, uh, uh, and uh, came in useful, actually, uh, just as an interesting, uh, you know, side note, uh, when Ian left to start the company, I was uh, halfway through my uh, uh, PhD thesis, uh, which, you know, for most students you would think of as a terrible thing, but uh, left me in the fortunate position of being both graduate student and head of MR physics at the uh, NMR Center at the time. Uh, and that in the end, it kind of worked out well because the technology that Ian went to leave to develop, of course, turned into the uh, seminal discovery uh, you know, of uh, many of our careers here. Well, so what happened at Advanced NMR? So, uh, of course, it wasn't just uh, uh, Ian. Uh, it was uh, people like uh, 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 Mark Cohen, uh, who was uh, there at the time, actually was a, a biology major, who was uh, brought in to try to help them figure out what the heck the tool would be used for. The presumption is that they would use echoplanar for imaging the heart uh, because it was fast enough to stop the motion, so everybody was focused on cardiac imaging. Robert Weisskopf on the right was a physicist at MIT, uh, interested in uh, doing something different than atomic physics at the time. Uh, really, the key guy on the technology was Richard Rosedzi, and I couldn't find a picture of him on the web. Um, but uh, maybe even more important, I found his patent. Uh, and this was uh, the key enabling technology. Uh, if you read it in detail, it was the description and uh, invention of a resonant circuit to be able to do echoplanar. Of course, today we have you know, much uh, more powerful gradient amplifiers and more sophisticated technology. But at the time, the ability to kind of uh, uh, oscillate, uh, turn on and turn off a gradient fast enough at the scale of a, of a full uh, human uh, gradient system uh, was just not possible. There were no gradient drivers that could do that. Uh, Richard came up with this very clever uh, re uh, resonance system, basically just a big LC circuit, big capacitor, uh, and then you know once it got going, you could charge it up and basically you know fire off that LC circuit and then do your echoplanar imaging during that uh, resonance. Very clever idea, and it was really uh, Richard's brilliance in doing this. He was a brilliant engineer, uh, and Robert and Mark who basically uh, put the uh, original uh, uh, program together. Now, of course, the very first scanner was still up in the factory, uh, but they were interested in doing experiments. They were beginning to think about these cardiac experiments, but Jack was still around, and he knew that uh, this would not only be useful for uh, imaging the heart, but could be used to image the thing he cared about, which was the brain. So, uh, you know, before we started doing human experiments, uh, we wanted to move to, uh, you know, do work in animal models, uh, but because we had a human scale bore, we could use a larger model. We had been doing work. Uh, in part, uh, our cardiac work was in canine models, so we had access to canine models. So Jack uh, kind of uh, uh, glommed on to one of those canine cardiac experiments and said, let's do our perfusion imaging experiment uh, in the brain, uh, in this case uh, of the dog, and he did so. And you can see now a lot of the features that begin to seem very familiar uh, to the kind of fMRI that uh, we would subsequently be doing. This is echoplanar imaging, 14 millisecond gradient echoes, quite conventional, a TR of uh, one second. Uh, and so now we had the full 2D temporal resolution uh, to be able to watch the bolus passage uh, completely. Here's just the uh, time course, really densely sampled, complete sampling of that uh, uh, initial first pass uh, uh, bolus, including the recirculation peaks we could see. Um, you know, all because we now had access to this, what was at the time, completely amazing and unique technology of human-scale uh, echoplanar imaging. Uh, 
So of course, again, wanting to validate to make sure, uh, careful investigator that he was, that each step we were uh, leaving something behind. There were no uh, surprises. He went and repeated the hypercapnia experiment. These were, again, very precise measurements. Here we had enough spatial resolution to image the uh, reactivity of both gray and white matter uh, to this uh, hypercapnic challenge. Again, now with an experiment that we could uh, imagine doing in humans. And so, of course, Perhaps no surprise, uh, with this uh, uh, very positive experience, we set out to see if we could do the human experiment. Uh, and here is the first one. Oops. Let's hope this. Oh, you don't say media. Oh. Give this a try. You're going to work for me? Ah. So frustrating. Well, I guess uh, you're not going to see it. I uh, was sure that it would. Uh, carry through, but it did, uh, it somehow did not carry through. Uh, good thing to check that before we uh, move, the, move on. Uh, sadly, you won't get to see that first uh, dynamic uh, time course, but I do have uh, uh, the consequence of that. Uh, this was uh, the first, I put uh, in quotes, normal volunteer, that was actually me. Um, <laughs> I figured uh, if somebody's going to, uh, you know, uh, sacrifice themselves uh, for the experimental good, uh, that should be me. Uh, Brad Bookbinder was the uh, physician in charge, uh, uh, expertly putting in uh, an 18-gauge uh, you know, catheter and uh, doing a, a hand bolus injection uh, while uh, Jack and others uh, watched from the front. Uh, and uh, while I sadly don't have the movie to show you, uh, you'll just have to trust me, it worked like a charm, exactly as, uh, as we showed uh, in, the, uh, in the animal experiments. Beautiful uh, uh, characterization of that first pass uh, uh, bolus. Uh, and uh, the uh, consequent uh, measurement of a physiologic map. This is now a map of blood volume. The integration under that curve uh, was really kind of the first human functional image, right? A direct image of uh, uh, vascular physiology uh, made with MR. Um, so, um, uh, you know, uh, shortly uh, after those uh, first experiments, were actually which were actually done not at the MGH, but up in the factory at Wilmington, we got our original scanner. We brought uh, began to bring some patients over. This was our uh, first case. Uh, here you can actually see the high temporal resolution sampling we could get uh, within the area of the stroke, uh, outside the area of the stroke. Um, and again, uh, you know, uh, you know, pre, uh, post, uh, kind of the dip of the contrast and the functional map, a functional map of blood volume showing the deficit in this uh, acute stroke patient. And of course, as many of you know, this is the technique that we use today to image patients with MR with acute stroke. Uh, in concert with the diffusion imaging, the ability to see the perfusion abnormalities, and in particular, to look for mismatches between extended areas of hemodynamic abnormality and the more focal areas of the diffusion abnormality are the key determinants of salvageable brain, right? Because it's areas that have limited delivery of blood but have already shown the metabolic impairment that's reflected in the diffusion image, that's the brain that we could spare. And in fact, in this case, uh, based on these images, uh, the patient was uh, uh, treated successfully, actually with a hypertensive treatment, despite the objections of the uh, cardiologist that uh, it was not gonna be good for his heart. The neurologist said, yeah, but it's good for his brain. Get in there and pump up the blood pressure and let's save some brain while we can. And sure enough, you can see in the follow-up, while this kind of core abnormality was there, much of this cortex was spared, and the patient actually uh, left the hospital walking and talking, uh, which uh, he wasn't uh, when he uh, was uh, delivered to the emergency room. So uh, the consequence of this work, used every day, and is literally uh, saving patients' lives. Um, we also did uh, some of the earliest uh, 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 experiments in uh, brain tumors. One of the interesting things about measuring Blood volume is that it was a measure of tumor angiogenesis. Uh, here uh, we can actually see um, um, the area of high cerebral blood volume, uh, increased tumor angiogenesis. And uh, I don't know if uh, Ciprian is here, but uh, uh, no, you weren't the first to do uh, MR PET experiments. Uh, this was back in uh, probably 1992 um, with the uh, great help of our next speaker and uh, Dave Kennedy in registering them. Here's the PET FDG image showing increased uh, tumor metabolism, increased tumor vascularity, uh, showing the relationship between tumor angiogenesis and high tumor grade active tumor metabolism. Uh, and of course, uh, even early uh, experiments back in the early 90s, uh, looking at this for therapeutic effects. Here, uh, looking at the effects of radiation necrosis, the uh, um, 
the radiologist would look at this area, break down of the blood-brain barrier, and might say, you know, is this uh, um, a recurrent tumor? Uh, but the low blood volume suggested no, it's actually a matter of uh, a dying tissue, dead tissue from the radiation effects, uh, and indeed the biopsy showed this was radiation necrosis. And again, this is a tool that we're commonly used. This is a recent paper by Tracy Batchelor and uh, uh, many colleagues, including Rakesh uh, Jain, uh, looking at the effects of anti-angiogenic treatment um, uh, and using this tool of perfusion imaging and several of the advances in the analysis that came from colleagues like Leif Ostergaard and Kerry Emblem uh, thereafter uh, to measure changes in angiogenesis over time. Again, using those same tools that Jack was able to get working uh, back uh, in the very early 90s. Um, but uh, as uh, Arno uh, highlighted, uh, while Jack was certainly interested in all things science and certainly in the clinical applications, his real heart was in brain mapping. So he was uh, interested, in addition to these clinical studies, to see how we could use this tool to investigate normal neuroprocessing. Uh, and of course, his uh, quote uh, from his thesis was that the time-resolved three-dimensional hemodynamic imaging could be useful for revealing parallel neural networks. In other words, the ability to image the whole brain might allow us to see brain activity. So he was envisioning these experiments really right from the start. Um, here's a quote from uh, one of his uh, early uh, articles, uh, just uh, elaborating on this point. Uh, that not only were these the highest resolution functional maps obtained at the time, PET, of course, uh, uh, was long since surpassed by these abilities, uh, but uh, in addition to doing basic experiments to look at homologies in the brain, this would really allow us to look uh, for novel features of uh, how the brain uh, coordinated uh, its data and uh, study kind of unique structure function relationships. That's, a, of course, exactly uh, what we continue to do today. Um, and uh, here's just a quote from his uh, original paper, um, which was uh, interesting because it foreshadowed uh, the experiments that you'll hear about a little later in a very important way, because he described that with the use of, uh, say, intravascular contrast agents, things that stayed in the vascular stream longer than the gadolinium agents, we would actually be able to perform a serial imaging continuously to be able to look at um, dynamic uh, flow changes uh, continuously uh, with the same technique. In other words, we wouldn't have to just do a bolus and get a single snapshot, but we could continuously measure if we had agents that stayed intravascular for a long time. And for those of you uh, who do uh, you know, primate neuroimaging here, these are examples from our colleague uh, Wim Van Duckvel, very elegant experiments of uh, uh, brain stimulation and looking at distributed cortical networks. When we do animal fMRI, we almost always use intravascular contrast agents like the iron oxides because they give us an even greater punch, but you can see we can get this very high temporal resolution here. T uh, time courses shown in yellow, uh, second by second uh, measures of blood volume measured with intravascular contrast agents. It's the best technique we have today to image uh, these hemodynamic changes. Uh, uh, and because some of these agents are now approved for human use, um, many groups are beginning to use this same technique for humans. So the very technique that Jack talked about um, uh, uh, is not just history, it's actually uh, current history. Just more examples of that. Uh, just another example from uh, a beautiful work from uh, uh, just showing a very high resolution uh, mapping again in the, uh, uh, in the visual cortex of the primate, again from the very high sensitivity of the technique that Jack developed. Well, so um, I think that's where I'm going to uh, uh, leave us off. Um, uh, remember, we didn't have those intravascular contrast agents at the time, but we did have a way to measure a snapshot of blood flow. Uh, and the question was, you know, how are we going to do those experiments and put all the pieces together? Um, and our next speaker will talk about that. But uh, before uh, I introduce him, I'll just uh, I'll close with a, a quote uh, that Jack uh, closed uh, his thesis with. Um, when Zarathustra said, you uh, must pursue uh, the leech, you know, the tiniest of creatures, uh, you know, to its uh, greatest detail, uh, the man said, no, that's way too complicated. Um, but what I'm the master of is the brain of the leech, and that's what I'm going to, that's my field, and that itself is a universe. And indeed, it's been uh, a large part of our universe for many years. So with that, uh, uh, thanks very much, and I'll introduce our uh, next speaker, uh, David Kennedy.